Yeah, I want, um, yeah, my name is uh, uh, Sisera Jayasurya. Uh, I'm with the Center for Development Economics and Sustainability at Monash University in Melbourne. Um, I want to uh, welcome you all uh, to this webinar on the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership uh, Agreement, uh, uh, which has been described as the world's largest uh, free trade agreement. Uh, and this is part of the series of webinars that uh, our center has been holding on issues of major public uh, importance. Uh, and in general, uh, you know, economic, uh, free trade agreements uh, have become quite common in the last uh, 30, 40 years. So, uh, and even though this is the largest one, you know, it would not have possibly warranted a bringing together of a series of a number of uh, global experts to talk about it, except that this is taking place at a time, uh, arguably, of the most serious uh, trade and geopolitical tensions uh, in the world since the 1930s. Um, so the whole issue of uh, trade policy and trade agreements between countries uh, has now become uh, so much subject to the political and geopolitical uh, uh, tensions globally and particularly acutely felt in Asia. So in that context, uh, it's, particular, it's very um, important that we get a view, different perspectives uh, on both the politics and the economics of this agreement. And uh, you know, I'm very pleased that uh, we got some of the, you know, some of the, the best authorities in the area, uh, trade policy analysts, uh, uh, including uh, one of uh, Australia's uh, senior negotiators. Uh, from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, uh, who have been intimately involved in all uh, at all stages of this uh, uh, agreement, which has been now signed by Australia as well. Uh, so, uh, so before I begin the formal uh, webinar, uh, I want to acknowledge. Uh, the traditional custodians of the land on which our four Australian campuses stand and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I would now like to invite Dr. Laura Panza, sorry, Dr. Laura Puzello, uh, my a CDS fellow and my colleague, CDS fellow and uh, member of the economics uh, department uh, staff to, uh, be the moderator of the event and to take over the running of the event and introduce the speakers and, and uh, 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 proceed with the, the substantive part of the webinar now. Uh, thanks, uh, Laura, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Cicira. Uh, it's my pleasure actually to moderate this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, so thank you and the center for the opportunity of doing so. Um, I will uh, just say a few words about RCEP, just uh, highlighting a few, a few things and then present, uh, uh, present the speakers. Um, as uh, Cicira mentioned, uh, um, RCEP is uh, um, a big free trade agreement, what we call um, a mega uh, free trade agreement that involves uh, um, Asian countries uh, that are uh, Asian is a trade block of Asian countries of 10 Asian countries, as well as Australia, China, Japan, um, New Zealand and South Korea. And uh, it is uh, a big trade agreement because it covers, it includes countries that account for a uh, one third of world uh, GDP. At a certain point in it was part of the discussion and left 
uh, toward the end, even though the door is not completely uh, closed. Um, and hopefully we'll have a chance to discuss this in the webinar. Uh, and what's interesting about this agreement, differentiating it from others, is that it uh, covers a diverse, sense of, diverse uh, set of uh, countries. We have rich countries like Japan and poor countries, like Laos included, but we have also big countries like China and smaller countries like very small countries like Brunei. So it's very um, different from other uh, agreements that we have signed, we have uh, seen signed among uh, richer countries. Uh, some people have complained, like our um, commentator have noticed that the agreement is relatively shallow as compared to other agreements because it's not uh, fully liberalizing trade among the members. Um, it is uh, um, dropping tariffs on 90% uh, of products traded, traded uh, among the members over a period of 20 years. And many of these countries uh, had already agreements in place. So that is um, one uh, comment. And uh, uh, it also is being criticized because it avoids touching on complex issues such as uh, cross-border uh, flows, um, um, e-commerce, uh, agriculture, and also state-owned enterprises. Uh, however, the agreement uh, um, in a more optimistic view has been seen as a very great success, a big success, uh, especially because uh, it has done much more than just uh, um, consolidating already existing uh, trade agreement between uh, the ASEAN group and each of the other non-ASEAN RCEP members. Um, it has uh, uh, succeeded especially in liberalizing uh, um, and uh, uh, unifying the rules of region uh, that uh, um, apply to the goods that are traded within the block. Just to make, uh, like I'm hoping to help out the discussion a little bit. The rules of origins are basically criteria that are used to establish the nationality of a product. And uh, um, um, they are relevant because they specify how much of a goods content must be uh, from uh, members of RCEP to uh, qualify for preferential treatment. Uh, um, and lower tariff, basically. And uh, uh, these uh, uh, can potentially have large uh, effect to spur global supply chains uh, in the region. Um, and so a favor of the region. Um, but it has, uh, um, the, the agreement itself is also is very flexible in specifying rules of origin. And hopefully we'll have time to discuss a little bit, bit this aspect of the agreement. Uh, another major, major achievement of the agreement is that it includes countries uh, that didn't have a, an agreement before, like Japan, China, and South Korea. So it opens up new relationships and also um, potentially spurs the creation of further uh, integration between, between these e economies that um, in the past uh, didn't um, engage uh, for uh, different reasons. Um, and finally, another surprising uh, and positive effect of this uh, uh, consequence of this agreement is the creation of uh, a secretariat um, that will discuss and uh, trade and uh, an economic issue in uh, Asia for the future. And that could actually uh, be a positive change in terms of making Asia the leader in the creation of rules that regulate um, things that are currently trade that is currently not regulated or um, economic uh, issues that are not currently uh, clearly regulated, so like uh, 3D printing, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, or um, blockchains. So this is just a background with what I thought are the highlights of uh, uh, RCEP. Um, I um, look forward to the discussion uh, by our speakers. That uh, it's an amazing uh, set of uh, group of uh, speakers. Uh, so I'm going to briefly introduce uh, um, them in the order uh, in which we have decided to um, organize the webinar. So um, the first speaker will be Professor uh, Simon Evanet. Um, he is a professor of international trade and economic development at the University of St. Gallen. And uh, um, Professor Ki Kimura is uh, uh, currently professor of economics at Kyo University and chief economist of uh, AREA, that is the uh, Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia. Uh, 
Arturo Omenon is a fellow at the Institute in Singapore. Um, Associate Professor Shiro Armstrong is uh, an economist at the, um, in the Crawford School of Public Policies at ANU, uh, and is also a director of the Australia Japan Research Center and uh, of the East Asian Bureau of Economic Research there. And finally, uh, Mr. Barbenblum is uh, um, uh, an assistant secretary in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, uh, and is uh, uh, actually um, the Australia lead for uh, RCEP and uh, overse has overseen um, part of the negotiation uh, as well as uh, the implementation of other agreements uh, um, that Australia has uh, uh, signed. Um, without further ado, I leave the floor to Professor Emanet. Thank you. And thank you, Laura, for that uh, introduction. Uh, let me advance a surprising proposition to you, and that is that despite RCEP being the world's largest uh, free trade agreement, and despite its very positive reception in the Asia-Pacific region, uh, this agreement has induced more indifference than envy in the European Union and the United States. And I want to argue that this is largely a function of the trade politics in uh, Washington and Brussels, rather than the features of RCEP, although the latter are important. I will make uh, four main arguments uh, in support of this proposition. The first is, as you said, Laura, there is a widespread view that this uh, agreement, RCEP, is a shallow agreement in the sense that it has relatively little uh, ta tariff liberalization especially when you take into account the 20 year time horizon. That it means it is less likely to induce trade diversion, which might be a concern for uh, trade officials in uh, trade officials and business associations uh, in Washington and Brussels. It seems looking at the studies of uh, Petri and Plummer that any uh, sort of adverse effect of the trade diversion is washed out by the trade facilitation gains largely, I suspect, on account of the rules of origin, uh, which are embedded in RCEP. And in fact, the estimates in the latest Petri and Plummer study I saw was that the, uh, the sort of medium term impact of RCEP on uh, the EU and the US would be zero by 20, 20, 2030. So there is nothing there to sort of induce uh, Washington or Brussels to wake up. The second reason why uh, this agreement is not likely to induce much envy in uh, those jurisdictions or those capitals is because RCEP is not seen as tackling uh, the key features of state capitalism, which is found in China and some other uh, less than market economies in the Asia Pacific region. And so this, uh, it, given the emphasis in both Washington and Brussels on uh, the state issue of state capitalism, RCEP will not be seen as necessarily um, a template upon uh, which we or which we can build. The third argument, and again, we get now more to the heart of the matter, is that in both Washington and Brussels, uh, trade politics has turned inwards, perhaps for different reasons. The Biden administration has made it clear it does not want to sign any reciprocal trade deals until the US economy is back on track. That essentially means it does not really want to conclude any trade deals uh, during the first two years of the Biden term. And since the second two years of the uh, first Biden term will be ones which will be dominated by re-election. Essentially, we are uh, being asked to uh, wait as far as reciprocal trade reform is concerned uh, for four years. That doesn't mean that talks cannot begin, but nothing will be concluded before the next presidential election in the US. And so, uh, you know, the sense in which RCEP can be built on uh, is, is going to be diminished in that sense. When you look at the European Commission, which has just issued a new trade policy, a re, uh, review, um, it has clearly um, signaled that it is putting more weight in reciprocal trade agreements on, on plurilaterals over multilateral and regional trading agreements. And there's a clear shift in the latest documentation towards plurilaterals. And that's on the assumption that they can do reciprocal trade deals. Uh, in fact, the biggest theme that comes out of the latest trade policy review document from the EU is um, emphasis on unilateralism dressed up nicely as open strategic autonomy, but unilateralism it is. And uh, the EU is, I think, very clearly signaled that it will move unilaterally in areas like 
uh, climate change and the like. So given where uh, trade politics is at in both of those jurisdictions, uh, there is not much of a hook. And this is important. We've seen the deterioration over time in, in Washington. Uh, we now see that in Brussels. Uh, and so in that, in a strange sense, RCEP comes uh, at the end of a stream of big hits as far as RTAs are concerned. And it may well be the last big hit for some time. Maybe CPP, TPP expansion uh, could be a next uh, sort of medium level hit. Uh, but still, um, RCEP comes at the end of a rush towards RTAs, uh, which is now, um, at least as far as the big players are concerned, over. The last uh, argument to make is indeed geopolitics already raised uh, with um, uh, by Laura here. Uh, we have a, a real problem in both Washington and Brussels in doing trade deals with uh, what might be called undem undemocratic countries. The European Union has a difficulty dealing with countries which are not serious about climate change on top. Uh, these are uh, uh, important considerations which are going, to, uh, are going to be there. I think furthermore, if you listen carefully to what you're hearing out of Washington, um, the uh, sense you get is that RCEP and the uh, agreement between the EU and China on investment are seen as divide and rule tactics, which China has successfully pulled off. China, on this view, is seen as having a great 2020. Uh, the US is seen as having not a great 2020. Uh, and that uh, essentially both the CAI and RCEP are seen as being uh, uh, instruments of Chinese influence. Now, I know that is not how many people prefer to frame it and discuss this issue, especially as an Asian-led accord, but that is how it's seen in Washington. Uh, and in that sense, there, there are real worries, uh, at least from that American point of view, that uh, East Asian nations and Asia Pacific nations and the European Union are um, uh, siding with China when in fact they should be siding in the Americans' view with them. So overall then, uh, you know, these are four reasons why the RCEP is not seen as being uh, particularly uh, a game changer in either Washington or Brussels. That doesn't mean that there's any necessarily much ill will towards the agreement, but it's unlikely to become a catalyst for a revival in, in global trade reform, which is a pity. So instead, we're going to have to look elsewhere for, for that type of impetus. And of course, eyes will turn to Geneva with a new director general. We will see where that leads. My last comment on global developments is simply to say that it's unlikely that RCEP will provide a blueprint for any of the plurilaterals which are currently being discussed, whether it's in e-commerce, any future measure, uh, measures we might have in trade and health and climate change. So in these areas where there seems to be a lot of momentum, RCEP doesn't seem to offer much too. So none of that makes RCEP unimportant, uh, as I'm sure uh, the points my colleagues will make on the panel, but it does suggest that the impact of RCEP is likely to be within the region rather than inducing a game changer at the global level in trade politics. Thank you very much. Hi, um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Simon, um, for your insights. Um, I would like to invite now Professor Kimura to uh, provide his insights on RCEP. Yeah, thank you very much. It's great to be a uh, part of this uh, great panel. Thank you for the invitation. Um, so my homework is to talk about a uh, view on a view of uh, Japan and Korea on RCEP. I, I mean, I'm Japanese. I stay in Japan, so I do not uh, understand the Koreans perfectly. Certainly not. Uh, but I try to uh, try to make a sort of good guess and what they are thinking. And also, uh, some elements are pretty common to Australia and New Zealand because we are engaging in uh, various uh, mega FTAs right now. And I think that uh, the meaning of mega FTAs are changing uh, so quite different from uh, five years ago. Uh, that's uh, the major point that I'd like to make today. Um, uh, certainly, uh, further liberalization and the international rulemaking, uh, those are uh, checkpoints that we have to uh, when we evaluate mega FTAs, uh, they, in order to catch up with uh, globalization and support factory Asia, uh, we need those. Uh, but uh, uh, we added two new roles, probably. One is to reduce policy uncertainties, 
Uh, the other is to form a pro-trade uh, middle power coalition. And because we have uh, the weakening of a uh, rule-based trading regime, actually East Asia is really depending on that very heavily. And also the US-China confrontation adds a lot of a uh, complication uh, in our trading regime and the COVID-19. So, so I think that the, uh, those two new roles are very important. Uh, and how we can utilize mega FTAs for those. I think those are uh, major points that we have to look at. And also mega FT, for mega FTAs particularly, assigning, uh, ratifying and being in effect, that's not the final goal. Uh, we have to uh, see the evolving nature of mega FTAs, <clears throat> say the expansion of membership sometimes, or as a deepening of commitments uh, for liberalization and rulemaking, and also utilizing as a communication channel. I think those are going to be more important than before. So the first one, liberalization. So this is a too, too, too much information, <laughs> a little complicated. Uh, but the same tariff removal, that's right. Uh, it's not very high. Uh, overall, 91% of tariff removal ratio. Uh, after 20 years, actually. Uh, but this is a bit higher than uh, the existing ASEAN plus one FTAs, uh, except ASEAN, Australia, New Zealand, actually. Um, and then so, uh, they have services uh, trying to go with a uh, ne uh, negative list but uh, uh, not all countries can catch up. So they need some additional negotiation and they have also certainly the investment liberalization over there. So. So I think the further tariff removals, particularly in CLMB compared with the existing ASEAN 1 uh, FTA. So this is additional liberalization. And also uh, we observe some unusual uh, asymmetric tariff removal pattern for uh, China, Japan, and Korea. Uh, actually, uh, depending on the uh, uh, member states, they are having different tariff removal schedule. This is very unusual. Uh, and, but uh, if you look at the uh, uh, rules of origin, this is very uh, trade friendly. Uh, this is better than existing uh, SEM plus one FTAs, uh, much better than CPTPP. And also uh, it emphasize, uh, emphasizes uh, customs procedure uh, trade facilitation. Actually the contents are pretty concrete. And also the utilization of uh, preferential tariffs. Uh, they, they are thinking of uh, various kinds of facilitation over there too. And then the Japan, Korea, Japan, China are connected finally uh, for the first time by an uh, FTA. Uh, so I think the five-year review is very important. Uh, they have to, uh, we, we have to catch up with the CPTPP at least to some extent in terms of liberalization and uh, the rulemaking. And next is the international rulemaking. Uh, the, actually the coverage of topic uh, is uh, pretty comprehensive. Uh, it's not include. It's not including uh, uh, state-owned enterprises, but others are, are pretty much there. But actually, if you look at the contents, uh, some are, are pretty pretty much empty, but some has some sort of contents. So actually, uh, that that is showing a sort of starting point of a future negotiation. This is uh, could be under under RCEP, could be. Uh, in other initiatives like uh, under WTO that have uh, what would be the starting point for China and ASEAN. Uh, so the particularly uh, e-commerce is interesting, actually, uh, at least in, in the text, that includes an, a no, uh, actually, uh, free flow of data and no data localization requirement uh, is there uh, in text. Uh, maybe it's not quite effective, uh, we can imagine that. Uh, but I, I think uh, this is a starting point of China that they, they could negotiate uh, over, for example, CPTPP. Uh, government procurement is there. This is uh, pretty rare uh, in uh, ASEAN plus one uh, FTAs, uh, but the contents are, are pretty thin, just a transparency, cooperation, and review. The third role, uh, reducing policy risks. Uh, but we observe that the uh, superpowers are really manipulating the trade policy uh, for a time to time uh, political agenda. And we are really worrying about that kind of things. So, so I think uh, uh, RCEP should be utilized as a communication channel, uh, particularly the communication is so bad uh, between Japan and Korea. They do not have any regular meetings actually, even if they are really uh, stay, sitting nearby. And also 
uh, we, we all are having a pretty difficult uh, uh, moments uh, in communicating with China too. I think so this, is a, this could be a really rare occasion that we can uh, discuss with China actually. Uh, we can do this uh, because of uh, ASEAN's initiative. Actually, ASEAN has been really leading the negotiation. Uh, so I think that's very important. Otherwise, uh, 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 CJK uh, couldn't be I couldn't be together actually. So, so I think uh, we have to really utilize uh, RCEP as a sort of communication channel, even if this is very difficult. Uh, the, the fourth uh, one, uh, forming pro-trade uh, middle power coalition. I think RCEP covers the whole factory Asia. Uh, so that is, uh, should be utilized as sort of uh, strengthening, at least uh, guaranteeing uh, the rule-based trading regime in the territory. Uh, India should come back uh, for, for its own reform and also strengthening our coalition. And uh, uh, the coupling pressure could come uh, from both actually, so from the US side and also the Chinese side. Uh, so particularly in case of Japan and Korea sitting just next to China. Uh, so very difficult uh, situation, but uh, so at least economically we'd have to uh, maintain a sort of good relationship, but maybe it, it may be difficult from now. But uh, at least uh, in terms of the trading regime, uh, RCEP should be a sort of anchor for thinking of that. Uh, so this is a simulation of uh, economic effects by Japan, uh, government of Japan. Actually, uh, the government is uh, worrying about uh, multiple different uh, simulations uh, done by different ministries. So, so these days they are having us only one uh, simulation. Uh, uh, they, they have some sort of uh, uh, manipulation of uh, figures to some extent, but uh, so the ex explanation is pretty uh, transparent. Actually, my one of my friends did that. I, I really trust him. Uh, so you can see uh, uh, the effects are uh, pretty big. Actually, if you just look at the tariff removal, probably 0. Point something percent. This is uh, actually the, the changes in on uh, Japanese real GDP. It's a cumulative G GDP increase divided by uh, the base year GDP. Uh, that's uh, the way of uh, calculating. Uh, but uh, uh, maybe quite uh, equivalent to uh, uh, TPP 12. Uh, so th that, that is coming from actually uh, job creation. Uh, this is unusual uh, in uh, a GTAP model, uh, but uh, uh, due to an increase in the uh, real wages, that, that has uh, more than half uh, effects. So uh, I, I think. Uh, uh, Petri, Plama, uh, Tsai uh, group is uh, now uh, trying to update the uh, simulation. Uh, figures could be a little bit lower for uh, RCEP, I guess, uh, but uh, something similar uh, figures are coming up, I guess. Uh, so that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, um, providing all these uh, uh, details and insights. Um, I would... Uh, oh, leave any question for uh, later. So I'll, uh, um, I would invite Dr. Menon to, oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Laura. It's thank great you. to be here today, uh, particularly for me, because I started my career at Monash at the Center of Policy Studies uh, in Clayton in those days, uh, many years ago. I won't tell you when, but they're very nice to be back, even if it's only virtually. Uh, please tell me if you can't see my slides or there's any difficulty, everything good. So um, like the others, I have been given a task to uh, focus on two issues. Uh, the first is to look at RCEP uh, from the perspective of the ASEAN countries, and then the interrelated issue of how uh, it might relate to uh, uh, global supply chains. So I have a bit to cover, so let me get going. Uh, now, the claim is often made that uh, RCEP is ASEAN-driven, it's ASEAN's the driver's seat, et cetera. But the fear is that it's China-driven. Um, now, this might matter uh, geopolitically, perhaps even economically, but perhaps less so economically. I think um, you know, RCEP, as we've heard from Fuku just now, is designed to support the supply chains in the region. Um, and uh, because of the prevalence of supply chains um, and the interdependence, um, I think all members stand to gain uh, 
but of course not equally. Uh, in absolute terms, I think uh, you know uh, most of the uh, um, simulation work has shown that the plus three uh, have the largest gains, uh, China, Japan, then Korea. Uh, that's uh, uh, to be expected. But perhaps in, uh, what we should be looking at is percentage terms. And this is where I think many countries in ASEAN can gain, uh, especially the newer member countries, because they can uh, go through the biggest changes in terms of policy reform if they implement the agreement faithfully. So that might be a big if, uh, but certainly the potential is there for all to gain uh, and uh, the world as a whole also gains, um, despite it being a relatively shallow agreement and so on. Um, so I think ASEAN's interests, however, um, are best served uh, in two ways. Uh, if RCEP firstly remains open and secondly, outward looking. So by open, I mean uh, admitting uh, new members um, after it comes into force. I think uh, after one and a half years from coming into force, they can open it up. And outward looking in terms of remaining multilateral and also multilateralizing its preferential accord as much as it can. Um, uh, as we've heard already, uh, the members of RCEP are also members of various other agreements. Uh, and some of them might end up pulling its membership in different directions. Um, you know, we have the Quad, we have the Indo-Pacific, we have the CPTPP, of course. Uh, so we want to avoid um, uh, splintering. Uh, and so uh, looking forward, uh, you know, I hope that RCEP can be a building block towards a broader agreement. Uh, a lot has been said about merging with CPTPP, um, but perhaps uh, FTAP, uh, the APEC agreement, uh, the free trade area for the Asia Pacific, might provide one option uh, because it's the one agreement that has uh, the US and China already in it. Uh, it's still early days and can be negotiated with everyone's interests uh, in mind. Uh, but anyway, um, I think uh, what I uh, hope RCEP can do is to bring these warring parties, literally uh, US and China, into a broader agreement somehow. Uh, I'm not being uh, overly ambitious, of course, but perhaps it can push the process in the right direction. But it's very important that our, uh, our set remain uh, outward looking. And I think uh, uh, ASEAN has done that because it had to, it doesn't have the critical mass to sustain itself. It has had to keep uh, its doors open and uh, looking outward. But RCEP of course is a lot bigger and can, and can look inward, but shouldn't look inward. Um, and it shouldn't do that because Unlike um, uh, Europe or uh, the US, uh, utilization rates of free trade agreements in Asia are generally quite low. In fact, 25% rates are considered quite good. Um, and they're low because uh, margins of preference uh, are usually low uh, because uh, we have relatively low MFN rates. Uh, of course, there are exceptions. Uh, but there's also lots of other agreements that bring down uh, uh, MFN rates, like the information technology agreement, that's very important for the supply chains uh, covering electronics uh, and related products. A lot of uh, uh, multinationals uh, operating in supply chains uh, within special economic zones that have duty-free privileges, and there's all other schemes, all other kinds of schemes like duty drawback, uh, bonded uh, warehouses, and so on, all of which, uh, you know, uh, lead to very low margins of preference. So, uh, you know, uh, it's not all that important actually to try and uh, increase utilization rates uh, when there's not much to utilize. And so um, I think designing rules of origin for uh, supply chain trade is difficult. And uh, I, 
I accept and agree that uh, uh, RCEP has done a good job with the rules of origin, keeping it flexible. But of course, I think the best rule of origin is the one that you don't need. And that's where they should be heading. Uh, and if you have fully multilateralized uh, preferences, then there's no uh, rule of origin uh, required uh, because there's no preference to utilize. Right. So um, the, uh, the other reasons for multilateralized preferences, uh, you know, compliance costs, of course, fall to zero uh, and benefits can increase. Um, I uh, want to share very quickly a table here that looks at comparisons between multilateralizing tariff preferences and uh, not multilateralizing them or sticking with what you uh, only need to do. Uh, this was done some time ago using the Monash multi-country model, uh, uh, interestingly enough. And here, uh, just focusing on two highlighted numbers there, you can see that, that 0 0.134 is uh, like Fuku showed us, the deviation from baseline increase in GNP for the members uh, with incomplete utilization of preferences uh, of the agreement. Uh, it's 0.42 when you assume, as most people do, full utilization. Uh, but if you multilateralize those preferences, the benefits increase to about 0.54, which is almost four times. Uh, so when you take incomplete utilization into account, even just for tariff uh, uh, liberalization, uh, the benefits go up sharply. And of course, I think a lot of the, num the numbers that Fuku showed us uh, you know, highlights that most of the benefit comes from all the other measures, the non-tariff measures uh, that uh, RCEP uh, focuses on. And uh, uh, on those other measures, I think uh, an interesting point is that they are naturally multilateral. So, uh, you know, a lot of these non-tariff reforms, uh, they're very difficult or it's costly to exclude non-members. Non and that's a good thing. Um, and harmonizing rules, uh, promoting regulatory convergence, which RCEP uh, is, is, uh, aims to do, can uh, strongly support uh, the growth and spread of supply chains in this region. So now I'm moving on to the second topic of supply chains. Um, now, while RCEP can do that and can help with that, I think uh, the US-China trade war uh, trumps RCEP in terms of impact, uh, pardon the pun. Um, and I think this is where it's quite important to place things in context. Uh, there's no equivalence or one-to-one -one relationship between changes in trade costs that RCEP can induce and the bilateral trade war tariffs. Um, and this is because uh, the tariffs is applied on the total value of the product, uh, not just the value added from China, but removing the value added from China would take away the complete tariff. So there is that uh, discrepancy. And we can measure uh, uh, what I've called the effective rate of spillover protection uh, from these bilateral tariffs when imposed within supply chain. And it's a very simple formula. All you have to do is divide the tariff rate by the Chinese value added alpha. Now to illustrate, I've estimated this for uh, US exports, uh, for Chinese exports uh, to the US for 2018, uh, so-called Chinese exports. Of course, we know that there's not 100% China value added for those exports. But uh, if you look at the bottom row for total manufacturing, you can see that uh, on average, uh, about 31% of so-called China exports uh, is Chinese content. Um, so what does this mean? Uh, this is less than one third. Well, it means that uh, for a 25% tariff, uh, which is the most common tariff in the trade war, uh, the effective rate on Chinese value added is 81%, uh, more than three times 
25%. Uh, so because the value added share is less than one third, the actual effective tariff becomes more than three times the nominal tariff. So 81% uh, here means that um, Vietnam, for instance, that might compete with China for activities currently taking place there, uh, will get that investment moving to its country as long as it's not 81% more uncompetitive than China. So that's quite a big buffer for countries that compete with China for activities that take place there. Right. Uh, now I'm trying to move my slides, but they are not cooperating. Um, I don't know if it's moving for you, but uh, it's not moving for me. Is it moving for you? No, try to, um, you know, reshare. Unshare and reshare. Let's see if that way. Right. Okay. Now let me try that. If I can. Sorry about this. Uh, oh, I think I know what's going on here. It's because I've got an external uh, monitor linked up. Yeah. Now you're muted by accident. <laughs> you're muted. Yeah. Jay, you are muted. Sorry, yes, okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, technology, what a wonderful thing, right. <laughs> okay, so uh, I was already gonna be short of time, but let me move on quickly then, apologies. All right, so um, yeah. So I think the main beneficiaries um, associated with um, uh, relocation out of China, right? Uh, will be some of the ASEAN countries. You've heard about um, uh, this quite a bit in the press and elsewhere, but I think ASEAN as a whole uh, will benefit um, you know, if this trade war is ended sooner rather than later. Uh, there's already been issues with transshipment concerns where goods are simply shipped through countries like Vietnam to try and avoid the US tariffs in the trade war. Um, goods from China, right? And uh, this type of transshipment, even when it's not happening, uh, can uh, accidentally uh, be tagged this way because there are no rules of origin in place, uh, no explicit rules of origin to identify what is a Chinese product. Uh, they can, it can also be used uh, as a way of actually uh, protecting uh, uh, against uh, the imports from these countries. Uh, so it can be used maliciously. Uh, so in short, I think the trade war harms China and the US as well as the world. And none of these things are good for ASEAN, right? So let me conclude. Um, so I think uh, uh, the main points that I want you to take away is that uh, ASEAN, uh, from the ASEAN perspective, it will benefit the most if ASEAN remains open and outward looking. Uh, it can support the growth and spread of uh, global supply chains through regulatory convergence, but it's the um, US-China trade war that's having the much greater impact on supply chains right now. And I think into the future because this, this trade war doesn't look like uh, ending anytime soon. Certainly the change in administration of the US so far doesn't seem to be doing, doing that. And I think this will be with us for a while. So, um, you know, if RCEP can somehow help uh, lead to a broader agreement that brings these two parties together and other countries as well, then I think ASEAN's interests will be best served. And um, uh, if it can uh, do this sooner rather than later, the, the better. So apologies for taking longer, partly because of technology, but thank you, uh, Laura, and back to you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Menon, and uh, no worries about technology, that saves us from time to time. Um, I will uh, um, uh, ask now as Associate Professor Armstrong to... Um, thank you continue. very much. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Um, it's a pleasure for me to join such a distinguished 
uh, panel and to talk about RCEP. And, and I've been asked to talk about China and Asia more broadly. So um, I've organized my presentation into three points. I basically want to talk about the importance of the agreement for East Asia, but also for the global system. Uh, secondly, I want to talk about how to manage the Chinese economy and the China relationship for countries like Australia, but beyond. Uh, and finally, I want to discuss the economic cooperation agenda. And I think this is where it differs from uh, European and, and North American agreements. And I think this is where potentially the biggest gains from the agreement will come, including um, the way in which it might become more open and outward looking, as, as Jay just mentioned. So let me just um, start with the importance of RCEP, uh, as I see it in this part of the world. Uh, I think it's first important to recognize that it, it helps reinforce ASEAN centrality. Um, it's been called and labeled China-led. Um, we've heard about that already. But of course, we know that it was conceived in Indonesia and it is ASEAN-led. It's central to ASEAN, achieving an ASEAN economic community and its quest towards a, central, uh, a single market. And it's important strategically for that reason, because ASEAN centrality helps manage great power rivalry and competition, acts as a bit of a buffer in our region. Not perfectly by any means, but it is important for our regional cooperation, economic integration and political uh, management of, of major power relations. It's importantly, RCEP is the first real binding regional agreement. We've had um, liberalization that's been based on uh, non-binding voluntary cooperation backed up by peer pressure um, and consensus-driven um, rulemaking and liberalization. This is the first major agreement in our region, really, that covers East Asia, that has binding commitments. And that's important at, at this particular time more than others, because um, as we heard already, North America, Europe, um, as they have become more protectionist or more inward looking, East Asia sending a strong signal to the world. It's more than a signal, but making strong commitments to openness and keeping markets open. And finally, as Laura mentioned, it does bring China and Japan into an agreement and the second and third largest economies in the world have been operating under the WTO and the multilateral system without um, expanding rules and liberalization beyond um, what they have under MFN. So that's really important. And finally, as has also been mentioned, the rules of origin uh, and moving to a common rule of origin uh, an RCEP certificate of origin that goes beyond CPTPP, beyond NAFTA 2.0 or USMCA. Uh, that's really important for supply chains in our region, for expanding the regional value chains, and importantly for um, um, spreading them across Southeast Asia. But we have to recognize that China is going to be central to that and central to that moving forward. So this discussion about diversifying trade, diversifying supply chains is going to have to happen in the context of China remaining really important in these and central in these supply chains. So then the question for me is how do you manage this difficult relationship with China? And I say difficult because it's difficult for a number of countries, but particularly right now for Australia. Um, we all know about the deterioration in the Australia-China relationship. Australia's faced unilateral trade sanctions from China, and there's been a huge breakdown in trust between Australia and China. Um, part of it is, of course, the US-China trade war that Jay mentioned and, and the phase one trade deal that diverts um, trade, but it's also, of course, geopolitics. And we have to remember and be realistic that big powers do what they want. So I think this is where we need to engage the reform elements in China and lock China into multilateral rules and international markets. And that's where all of East Asia locking China into rules and enmeshing China um, and its actors into international markets through RCEP is gonna raise the costs of Chinese unilateral behavior when they, those behaviors contravene the spirit of RCEP and try to intervene in international markets. So I think that's where RCEP is really important um, for dealing with China. Countries in RCEP can deal with China not alone, but with other countries as well. And I think on those same terms as other countries, this is where it's a real pity that India, one of the reasons India couldn't sign up to the RCEP agreement was fear of being flooded by Chinese imports. Um, 
Indian economy is still going to have to deal with the Chinese economy. It could have done so within the RCEP context uh, with other countries. Um, and I think it's important to recognize the context here, although it's not unclear whether we'll get this comprehensive agreement on investment between China and the EU up. That's a pretty strong positive signal of the Chinese willing to continue to sign up to rules and reform. And we've, of course, had President Xi Jinping's signaling interest in joining the TPP or the CPTPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. And that um, would require huge uh, efforts to reform and commit to, to reforming SOEs in China, state-owned enterprises. Um, and I think um, the best reading of that would be that the Chinese reformers want to use that external pressure like they have in the past and like they do so successfully when they put their mind to it, to use external pressure to reinforce and push reform at home in China. So I think that's where um, the rest of East Asia and, and the rest of us need to engage the Chinese economy. Um, they've signaled an interest. I think it's in our interest to get China to the starting line uh, and for the to, if the Chinese are able to make these commitments, I think that's in our, our interest. So finally, I want to shift to the economic cooperation agenda, and I won't spend too long on this, Laura. I know we want to get to the discussion. I think this is where there's real potential benefit from the agreement beyond what the commitments are that have been made on tariff liberalizations and, and the rules now. This can really turn it into a living agreement from a one-off static agreement. Um, we're used to this sort of uh, painstaking talk shop um, uh, approach to, to economic cooperation in the region through ASEAN and APEC, and that takes time, but it builds consensus, it builds understanding and trust between countries. Um, now we have the opportunity to do this in an RCEP framework to implement RCEP commitments, um, but also go well beyond that because there are a lot of issues, deeply domestic issues, that cannot and probably should not be negotiated. And so this is where you can have economic cooperation on really behind the border issues that help improve the business environment uh, and address new rulemaking around digital, cyber, uh, supply chains uh, and other issues. We've had a little bit of, um, we've had a lot of experience in the region, but think about the Australia, ASEAN, New Zealand free trade agreement and the economic cooperation agenda in that. Uh, that was largely capacity building, but a very successful effort um, on, say, uh, competition policy. So the opportunity is there. The economic cooperation agenda is yet to be fully defined. Um, it's how the members, the countries, operationalize this economic cooperation agenda that's embedded in the RCEP agreement. It's a pillar of the agreement. And this will be key, how it's operationalized. Um, there are a number of important shared interests with the Chinese and with the other membership as well, including on supply chain resilience. Uh, working with the Chinese and working in the region on bringing transparency to these supply chains, on digitalizing supply chains. As I mentioned, China is going to be central to the regional supply chains, so it's, it's incumbent on the membership to work with the Chinese system. It's also a way to bring in other countries, I think, that are not fully full, full members of RCEP into the conversation around key issues um, that are a shared interest. And here I think about India, but beyond India and think about other South Asian countries and other economies in our region, that um, this is a way to engage them on issues of interest, bring them into these East Asian supply chains, value chains, um, and uh, create the pathway towards membership. I think it's a framework for engagement um, between countries, not just on economic policy and sharing economic policy ideas and experience, but this is where getting close to countries, um, building that cooperation and confidence and trust over time, uh, this has a strong element of political cooperation beyond just economic cooperation. So I think um, um, hopefully that helps complement the other presentations. Uh, I think um, look, as Simon said at the beginning, it's not a game changer at the global level. I think it is a game changer in our part of the world. And I think it's very important for the rest of the global system too. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I uh, would invite our last uh, speaker to uh, talk, Mr. Farbenblum. Um, we are very excited to have you um, and hear what you think about 
and how hard it was to negotiate it. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to participate in um, in this seminar webinar. Uh, let me just correct something. Uh, I personally was not involved in the RCEP negotiations. I was around uh, in DFAT at the time that uh, the negotiations commenced, and I had a lot to do with the uh, negotiation and conclusion of uh, Australia's other regional agreement with ASEAN, which uh, Cheryl has just referred to, the um, ASEAN Australia New Zealand FTA. Uh, my colleague who was going to present today, James Baxter, was the chief negotiator uh, for the last couple of years, but prior to that, um, one of our very experienced uh, negotiators, Michael McGliston, um, was uh, the one who started the negotiations and carried them through for many more years. Um, now, uh, you've sent me the question of uh, um, what are the implications of the agreement for Australia? And uh, my simple answer is very positive. It's a very positive outcome for Australia and for the region. Um, now, as I'm the last speaker, uh, obviously there'll be some overlap in what I have to say, um, but that's fine. I'm gonna keep my comments fairly uh, brief. Uh, I think you've heard uh, quite a bit of substance from the other speakers and um, that'll allow more time for a uh, discussion and some questions. Uh, so why does uh, RCEP matter? Um, for me, the most important thing is to note that it's been delivered uh, during a time when the region is facing uh, quite a number of challenges. Uh, as others have said, a time of difficult relations between the major countries, including the United States, China and India. A time when the multilateral rule-based system of trade is under stress and in need of fundamental reform. And a time of ongoing health and economic pressures associated with COVID. RCEP will help strengthen regional economic integration. There's no question about that. It will also help to build strategic confidence. RCEP complements and supports an open, inclusive and rules-based system. It also sends an important sign of confidence in trade liberalisation and rules-based arrangements at a time of significant economic term, downturn and global trade tensions. The agreement will lock in market access and address non-tariff barriers, creating new trade and investment opportunities across the region. It'll strengthen regional value chains. It'll establish rules that provide greater certainty and it'll help improve the business environment across the region. Now for Australia, RCEP brings together nine of Australia's top trading partners into a single economic framework. So it definitely provides improved commercial opportunities for Australian business. It delivers improvements over some of our existing FTAs with RCEP parties, particularly in areas where partners' economies have the greatest growth potential, such as services, investment, and digital trade. It provides a very solid base for a second upgrade of our other agreement with ASEAN and New Zealand, ANSFDA, and Shiro just referred to that. Um, we're now embarking on uh, an upgrade, set of upgrade negotiations for ANSWDA. And uh, one of our main objectives in that upgrade is to bring across into our, our ANSWDA agreement um, the outcomes that were secured through RCEP. So there's an iterative process with, between the two agreements. And then I expect in turn, uh, what we end up um, negotiating in ANSWDA and try and do that within a two or three year window will then I think inform uh, the five-year review of RCEP. So there's a, a dynamic that um, is likely to unfold, particularly through the economic cooperation uh, activity that Shiro just referred to. Um, for those who haven't focused on it, that's in article uh, chapter 15 of the agreement. Uh, RCEP reflects Australia's commitment to ASEAN centrality and our support for regional economic recovery. The final point on um, the significance of RCEP and others have touched on this and it goes to the ASEAN centrality issue. It's demonstrated ASEAN's proficiency in providing a trusted and effective convening function, which is supported by a highly effective and experienced secretariat. At the signing of the agreement last November, re represented a remarkable success story delivered through a, a very challenging period, including the adjustments to COVID, the implications of that for the way Previously, uh, the parties were meeting and negotiating. And of course, we had to deal with the withdrawal of India from the negotiations. And the ASEAN Secretariat uh, wonderfully uh, figured out a way for us to continue our work 
throughout uh, that year and to actually get to the, the signature of the agreement in November. Now, of course, we all want to return to in-person meetings, but what we've learned through this final year of RCEP is that we can get our, our work done virtually if needed. And we're already starting to use that technology and that know-how and that ability for um, the, the ASEAN members to interact through uh, virtual processes. We're going to be using that for the ANSFER upgrades. So this is not an um, irrelevant thing. I mean, typically negotiators would meet for four or five days in a row, have many meetings back to back and, and side by side, um, and, and you know, there would be a certain uh, environment for the negotiation. And we can't replicate that entirely uh, through virtual meetings. But the fact that we're able to conclude RCEP, I think, is, is very significant. It shouldn't be underestimated. Um, I also just want to um, make a few remarks, finally, uh, final remarks on the question of, uh, you know, whether this is an ASEAN-centric agreement or you know, how it's sort of perceived in terms of China's role. Um, and this is a question, I think, that was posed in, in the um, in presenting the webinar, one of the key questions. So is this a reflection of Chinese dominance in determining the regional trade agenda? And, and uh, clearly, I think it is not. Um, others have made the point about the, the uh, commencement uh, of us, of how it started. Um, I mean, I, I know from observing, not participating, that uh, uh, certainly Japan was a major uh, participant in both the launch, but during the negotiations had, a, I would say, an oversized role in, in um, you know, pressing for the structure and the momentum. Um, Australia early on had high levels of ambition, which we've maintained throughout the agreement uh, negotiations, and we weren't successful in everything, um, along with New Zealand, but we, we pressed as hard as we could in a range of areas. And, and many aspects of the uh, existing uh, Australia, as in Australia, New Zealand, FTA, ANSFDA, uh, were carried across and you know, were sort of relevant for the negotiations. So um, clearly not China dominated in its negotiation. Um, obviously, the agreement builds on the existing ASEAN plus one agreements, and it does, as I mentioned before, establish an effective struggle, structure for um, future regional economic integration. The single set of rules and procedures to access tariff um, preferences um, with RUS and the custom documentation will be extraordinarily, extraordinarily important. Um, a final point, it provides a foundation, as others have said, for further trade and investment globalization over time. We've got the five-year review, we've got the detailed uh, inbuilt agenda, uh, as well as the economic cooperation activity. These two go side by side. There's a whole range of areas where the parties have committed to return, to continue negotiations and discussions or dialogues, and they're, they're scattered throughout the, the treaty text. Um, and then there's economic cooperation to support uh, that activity. There'll be a new RCEP secretariat established. The details of that are not yet determined but it will be an independent RCEP secretariat that will exist uh, outside of the, um, or separate from the, the ASEAN secretariat. And as others have just referred, there'll be, uh, I think this was uh, the point made by um, Professor Kimura, there'll be um, ongoing ministerial and senior economic official engagement, channels of communication, you know, which provide a, a mechanism for broader dialogue on trade and economic challenges and policy issues facing the region. Well, that's my presentation and um, look forward to participating in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, um, sorry for um, giving you up the negotiate of the RARSEP. And um, I, I, uh, I really enjoyed um, all the insights you have provided. Um, the, it goes much deeper to um, about my understanding of uh, uh, the agreement, and uh, I think the audience benefits from this view. Um, I would give you a chance if you want to um, comment further each other uh, presentation or have any question that uh, you would like the group to discuss. Otherwise, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll just jump with some thought and Q&A from the audience. Okay, so then um, I would um, just uh, actually, I would like to deepen a little bit the discussion we have had to um, the, 
uh, both Professor Evanet and uh, um, Associate Professor Armstrong have touched upon that uh, um, RCEP is not really a game changer for uh, the EU and uh, on the US, but regionally uh, makes a big difference. I guess I would like your thoughts, like how do I get around uh, the idea that this is a big deal for the region um, and it will induce deeper integration um, however, <laughs> the EU and the US are not worried about it because to me, if some, you know, uh, I would expect um, particularly, uh, um, okay, for um, like trade, it might not change too much uh, uh, the geography of trade, but uh, in my mind, I was having the perception that it would do a lot actually for strengthening this regional supply chains and to some extent would increase the competitiveness of the region um, outside you know globally um, and so I'm um, I, um, I have like I'm not sure I would like your thoughts about um, the fact that you know the US and the EU are not worried about this um, even if in my mind they should be a little bit um, so I'm missing something and I would like your insights on this. Should I jump in first and then Simon can, can jump in? I think I, I'm not too worried that um, the United States or the European Union are not worried about RCEP. In fact, it's probably better that way. It's not targeted for any reason. Um, uh, and we'll see, um, you know, I, I talked about why I think it's got huge potential and why it's potentially very important. Um, we'll see how successful it is over time in not just implementing its commitments, but um, as Jay said, and I think is really important, uh, especially for how the region has operated in this open regionalism manner, regional cooperation, not at the expense of the rest of the world. So if we see trade starting to be diverted away from the United States and the European Union and, and elsewhere, um, you know, I, I think that's something that the region has to be conscious of. Um, and I, I think, um, I mean, we'll, we'll see, it's a, it's a test. I come back to the point that I think as um, we saw a rise in protectionism elsewhere in the world for this dynamic part of the, the global economy in East Asia um, to commit to opening up further and to lock in those um, that liberalization, commit to new rules, they're not where some people might want them to be. I think that is quite significant. So, Laura, I think my reaction to your uh, observation is that um, it's a matter of what the Europeans and the Americans want to see done, what's a priority for them. And they're, in both cases, their focus is on uh, what moves the needle in terms of reform in China. Now, this is where Shiro's original comments were quite interesting because he came very close to articulating a theory of change as to how RCEP could induce change in China by strengthening the reformers. Now, maybe that's a point which Shiro can elaborate upon later, but that's really, this is the uh, million dollar question in, in Brussels and Washington, what gets the needle to move in China? Now you could ask that question, by the way, more broadly within the ASEAN region, how this agreement can reinforce reform dynamics. And I think that's a really important question for all the reasons that um, Shiro highlighted about how this could uh, you know, drive reform, drive growth within the region. In, on just a final comment on Shiro's observation about protectionism, it's true that at least the work that my team has done and others, we've shown that there's more, more and more shares of world trade which are covered by trade distortions. But most of those trade distortions are in the areas of subsidies. And again, this takes us back to you know, what type of reform dynamics are we seeing around the world and you know, how can we strengthen them? So let me leave it there. Thank you. Do you, Shiro, do you want to follow up? Or? Uh, very quickly, I don't want to dominate the, the, the airwaves. Um, but yeah, look, the question about how much it moves the needle in China. Um, I, I think the fact that the Chinese signed up to RCEP is a, a very strong positive sign. Um, they're not hugely um, game changer commitments for China like CPTPP would be. Um, and you hear reformers in China say, well, you know, RCEP is, is 
useful, but it doesn't provide that leverage we need from the outside that the TPP would, and I have heard that. Um, and, and so I think um, just recognizing progress, but of course we wanna go further. Um, and, and to note that I think uh, it is a real pity that India pulled out um, of the agreement for a number of reasons, obviously, but India, I think, and this is where um, Simon can correct me, but um, really did water down some or try to water down some of the provisions. Um, and we, we tried to keep the Indians in without compromising the agreement, of course, and, and the quality. Yeah. Um, whereas I don't think that the Chinese were a problem in that sense. Um, you know, of course, you know, negotiating over all that time, uh, many countries were, had issues on a number of things, but I don't think the Chinese were dragging the, the agreement down. And that's for, for others to, to correct, I think, if, if I've got that wrong. Um, we have a few questions uh, from uh, the audience, so I'll, I'll try to get let's see if we can address them. Um, and then if I, we have time, I have other questions that I'm be more than happy to ask you. So one question is about investment, I guess, uh, um, and the effect of uh, on investors that the agreement uh, might have. Uh, um, so um, one um, person asks, so Japanese and Chinese investors have started to scour for strategic ties up in ASEAN with small and medium enterprises. Um, we expect um, Australia to do the same. And uh, I guess this um, is related more to also what RSF does for investment in uh, the region. And uh, um, who wants to take it? Look, I will very quickly, because um, uh, I think, I, I mean, I hope Australian investment into East Asia increases, but traditionally it's gone to New Zealand, the United Kingdom and the United States, where there's more familiarity and Australian investors are risk averse. So this is where at least RCEP can help provide some more investment certainty. And these are the dynamic economies in the world, not New Zealand, not the United Kingdom, and not the United States, um, I'm sorry to say, but this is where more investment could be going into Southeast Asia, China uh, and elsewhere. So um, the short answer is, do we expect it? Not really, do I hope so? Yes. Thank you. I hope Kimura-san or Jay or someone else wants to join in here. <laughs> so I think one one um, thing I was aware of is that they don't have yet an investment uh, uh, settlement, uh, ISDS. Uh, and so I was wondering whether you think that that is going to be a problem because I think New Zealand uh, is quite opposed to, to that. And so there is some commitment to probably, uh, um, Simon, uh, can you, oh, Simon Farber Bloom, if, can you say something about that in relation also sure. to the question? I mean, I, I really, I can't disclose what the um, positions of the countries negotiating were, but I, I think New Zealand's position is relatively well known. Um, there is a provision in RCEP uh, for uh, discussions to continue on uh, ISDS uh, after two years and uh, for those discussions to be completed within three years. Um, but that, do that doesn't mean there will be ISDS added. It just means that it's one of those issues I've mentioned before as a built-in agenda will, will be returned to. Um, and, and I think that's a good compromise uh, for uh, the negotiators when there wasn't a consensus on including ISDS, so there was a way of um, you know, not excluding it forever and providing a mechanism for an ongoing conversation about it. I mean, those of you who follow this uh, debate globally will know that um, ISDS has um, you know, been popular and then less popular and, and popular again. I think a lot depends on um, you know, where any particular country is, the nature of the government, and including whether they've had to defend against an ISDS case in their own country, my um, observations is that once a country's had to defend one or two um, ISDS cases brought against them, they tend to be less um, in favour of including them in future uh, agreements, or they look to adjust their existing investment treaties because of 
the consequences of those claims. Um, just on the question about investment um, in Aust Australian uh, companies, look, uh, we certainly hope so. Um, and uh, I mean, I think there's a complex nature of interactions for businesses. There'll be Australian businesses, Australian owned businesses in Australia looking to see you know, whether their engagement with the ASEP countries you know, should be adjusted, uh, perhaps um, you know, taking advantage of the, uh, the rules of origin talked about. Um, there'll be um, companies in Australia that are uh, subsidiaries uh, are owned uh, by um, other countries, nationals and companies who will be exploring uh, you know, the opportunities that, uh, again, the rules of origin and accumulation might offer. Um, there'll, be, there'll be services outcomes where Australia is highly competitive uh, that uh, companies will be looking into. Uh, including companies that are already in Southeast Asia, so it might you know might be a growth in in, in activity. Um, there'll be companies that are operating in China, in Japan, in Korea, um, who might you know look at their operations and think how it'll be adjusted. So every company will have their own story and an opportunity, and there'll be many uh, many firms. There'll be a I think a boost of services firms offering advice on ASEP. That in itself, I mean, ASEP will create its own virtual circuit circle of uh, new business opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Kimura? Yeah, I think uh, uh, investment is very active in this region. So definitely we need some sort of uh, dispute settlement mechanism. Uh, uh, definitely. Uh, say it's a sudden change, policy changes in the local government and the central government doesn't do anything. Uh, so that kind of things would happen actually. Uh, but actually, the, yeah, you know that the Japanese government is very positive about the ISDS in negotiations, uh, but the Japanese companies uh, are not really using <laughs> ISDS much in many times, actually very few cases only. Uh, but uh, so, so, uh, I don't know if ISDS is the best way to do or not, but definitely we need something there. Uh, I heard that there are some adverse cases from, uh, for the US uh, recently in ISDS, and some are uh, getting a little bit skeptical about that. Uh, so, so maybe uh, uh, in, in the context of TPP2, we may have a, a little bit uh, uh, do some sort of review on that system. Um, Laura, maybe I'll just say something from the yes. ASEAN uh, perspective again. I guess, uh, you know, if you look at ASEAN, um, you know, it's had a, it revamped its own dispute settlement mechanism uh, in preparation for the uh, ASEAN economic community. And it's never been used. In fact, there's uh, no risk of it, I think, ever being used because it doesn't seem to be, you know, the ASEAN way, as they often say. Uh, my favorite saying for about ASEAN is that it's all carrot and no stick. So uh, unless countries feel that you know there uh, uh, there are uh, benefits in it, uh, then uh, they're going to have difficulty pushing through these reforms. So the challenge is to sell the uh, the message of the benefits of reform, uh, which are usually long term, which which makes it harder. Uh, because there are short-term costs to a lot of these reforms, uh, but long-term benefits. So, uh, but it doesn't seem to be the way things proceed. But of course, the difficulty here is that as the agenda becomes more uh, more ambitious and demanding, you can't uh, relying on goodwill uh, is not a very effective way of uh, doing things. So that's I think uh, the uh, dilemma facing uh, RCEP. Uh, you know, this balance between uh, carrot and stick uh, that we need to pursue. But so far, it seems like we, maybe that we can do a bit more in selling the message on the benefits. Uh, but uh, eventually, I think uh, there's always a recourse to the WTO. I mean, if now the, um, uh, you know, uh, the quorum can be restored uh, with the uh, appointment to reappointment to the appellate body, then th th that's always there as well. So that can be a substitute of sorts, I guess, but I think eventually they'll have to look at ways of enforcing some of these uh, uh, more difficult reforms uh, within our set. Thank you. We have other questions in uh, from the Q&A. So what, two questions are actually related. Uh, um, so the audience is wondering whether, um, what would be the implication for RCEP 
uh, should the US or UK uh, join the CT CPTPP? Um, and uh, uh, any thought on that? Okay, I might go first then if uh, no one else <laughs> is coming in. Um, I can see the US coming into the CPTPP, it had its chance uh, and then it left and then it's most of its, uh, you know, uh, pet items uh, got diluted. So uh, they can't come in now uh, in a very different agreement and expect that a lot of those things can be reintroduced, but they can't uh, pretty much. But, um, uh, and, you know, uh, China has said it would like to join CPTPP Let's see if this is just rhetoric or whether um, you know it's serious. Um, I think um, you know if Vietnam can. People often say, "Oh, China has you know too much baggage with the state-owned enterprises and so on." But Vietnam and uh, and Malaysia uh, have the same baggage, and they were able to you know get carve-outs and uh, delays in implementation of those reforms, which made it you know uh, quite. Uh, acceptable to them uh, to sign up. So I think that shouldn't be the barrier uh, preventing China from coming in. But like I said, I think, um, you know, uh, a face saving option to bring China and the US uh, together might be FTAP uh, through APEC. Uh, again, it's new, there's uh, no, no uh, you know, uh, uh, it can still be molded uh, and negotiated um, freshly. Uh, that might be uh, the way forward. But um, uh, the question is whether RCEP can help move, uh, move us in that direction uh, faster than uh, it, would, it would otherwise move. Uh, we don't know that yet. Please. Yeah, I, th I think the uh, uh, U.S. would come back after two years, but probably adding some uh, new items, right? So uh, labor environment, uh, those are uh, include, were included in uh, USMCA uh, based on the sort of uh, uh, pro additional proposal coming from Democrats at the time. So, so I think uh, it's very likely to have those kind of new items. Uh, and then uh, labor and uh, environment, that could be uh, pretty tough for some uh, developing countries too. So uh, we have to watch very carefully what would happen. Uh, I think the UK would come uh, pretty soon. <laughs> uh, and then uh, membership expansion is very important for CPTPP. Uh, that would stimulate a sort of upgrading of uh, RCEP too. Uh, uh, how to set that sort of... Uh, um, a good set of homework for China. That's uh, that's one issue that we have to be very serious. Think about very seriously. Um, so, so e-commerce. I talked about that a little bit. Uh, so, uh, just in uh, text, actually, they accept uh, as a free flow of data and uh, no data localization requirements. Uh, subject to such and such, of course. But uh, I think that's a starting point that they would think of. So, so I think uh, it's very important for CPTPP to watch very carefully that the existing members are really uh, complying uh, those kind of uh, rules or not. Uh, some sort of review of uh, the implementation of a CPTPP would be very important. Laura, if I could just jump in on the United States um, coming back into the TPP, um, my understanding was that it wouldn't join CPTPP. Um, it doesn't join agreements, it only creates agreements, so it'll rejoin TPP, which will be a huge negotiation, I, I think, again, because um, we'll have to include some of those provisions that um, other countries watered down as they join the CPTPP. Uh, but also, as Kim Rasan san said, uh, it, it will, the United States will want to include new provisions, I think. So it's not going to happen easily or automatically. Um, and it won't be easy for the rest of the CPTPP membership that has moved on now. And just on China joining the CPTPP, um, you know, effectively every single 
existing member has a veto on new membership. So Beijing will have to convince um, every other capital, um, every other country um, of, of, to let it in. But you know, if, if the Chinese reach the correct commitments um, and, and are ready to join, um, they can clear the hurdle. Uh, like I said before, I think it's in our interest to, to engage them on that and to make sure it's not just rhetoric. Thank you. We have a question from the former chief negotiator, Michael Magpilston. I hope I didn't mispronounce uh, his surname. But uh, so the question is, what are Professor Kimur and other panelists view on India's withdrawal from RCEP? Um, do you think he's going to rejoin? And if so, when? Uh, you were called the pawn. <laughs> yeah, thank you for the question, Michael. <laughs> um, I think the current current domestic politics of India would uh, make uh, the situation very difficult uh, for them to come back. Um, but uh, uh, recently, I made some sort of really simplistic exercise using uh, some trade data. And India is not really engaging in the world trade as a whole. And also the connection with uh, East Asia is very thin. So that, that's a potential actually. So they, they have a, a good uh, production networks just nearby. How, how come they do, do not use that? I think uh, somehow we have to convince them to uh, make a necessary reform and come back to East Asia. Uh, so I don't know how to do that, but uh, we just uh, try to keep saying that. Yeah, one more thing is a sort of a connection with uh, services and uh, manufacturing. Uh, they have a, a pretty good basis of uh, engineering uh, industry, uh, but not very competitive in the manufacturing as a whole. But uh, they have very good uh, software, ICT services. Uh, they have to develop some sort of good connection between the, them. Uh, if you look at uh, China, uh, they start doing that in Shenzhen and other places. And India should learn about that too. Laura, can I just uh, add to that a little bit? I think uh, uh, I agree with uh, Fuku on uh, uh, the difficulties of India coming back anytime soon. In fact, I don't think it'll happen while the Modi administration is in power. Um, and uh, I mean, the, the concern is that, you know, um, decades of difficult reform that India has pursued finally are now being reversed. Uh, uh, and that's, you know, uh, that goes beyond just pulling out of RCEP, uh, the much bigger issues uh, on the trade front. Uh, domestically, you know, there have been some reforms with the you know, attempt to harmonize, uh, you know, the myriad of uh, domestic taxes with the GST and so on. But at the border, uh, India is certainly obsessed with this bilateral balances again, uh, that it might, you know, uh, worsen. I mean, it, it uh, assesses every bilateral agreement by whether it improves its trade balance or not. Uh, I think we need to, uh, you know, uh, uh, sell the idea more strongly. Well, two things. One is about, you know, why bilateral balances shouldn't matter that much. And secondly, uh, even if they did matter, the way we measure them these days, uh, with all the global supply chains in place, they're not very accurate. Uh, indicators of what we think we win or lose out of these agreements. They're not, uh, you know, uh, uh, good measures of, e of even that obsession. So if we can, uh, you know, get those two messages through, not just for India, but many countries, uh, then I think uh, we can start reversing a lot of these concerns. Thank you. <clears throat> I have one last question and then we close off. Um, so can this agreement constrain bilateral sanction on trade such as those we have seen between China and Australia? I think Shiro, you mentioned something when- Yeah, look, I, I, I tried to cover this a bit in my initial remarks. I think, um, you know, when a big power like the United States or, or China wants to unleash or intervene in the market, unleash some unilateral sanctions. Um, 
you know, requires a pretty strong response, I think, and, and I, I put in terms of raising the costs of, of doing this, whether it's through, um, you know, multilateral pushback in, in rules, but beyond that, I think being able to impose costs on, on these countries and making it clear that it's not in their interests. And so um, um, will RCEP be enough? Well, I, you know, it's a pretty big group of countries, all of ASEAN, and Japan, um, for, for example. So um, I think that's a pretty big constraint. If, if other countries, and I think this is already happening, um, you know, China's um, trade sanctions on Australia raises the cost of doing business with China and, and companies and others lose confidence um, in engaging with the Chinese economy because of um, the uncertainty around what might come from political reasons. So. So I think um, my response to that would be for more multilateral rules or more multilateral engagement in enmeshing China in more rules, so that the, uh, in more markets, sorry, so that the, the costs on China from deviating from, from what is agreed will be larger. Yeah, you see, so we had, uh, Japan had uh, rare, rare metal issues already 10 years ago. And um, say uh, bananas from uh, the Philippines, right, right now, pineapples <laughs> from uh, Taiwan. I think uh, tra trade policy is really uh, utilized uh, for time to time uh, political purposes, actually. I, I think we have to say something that's hard to say that. <laughs> but uh, I think even, even in the case of, uh, say, South. Uh, China Sea issues, uh, ASEAN tried to say something together. I think we should do a sort of similar thing in RCEP meeting or other occasions. I think uh, that's that's very important to communicate, even if uh, we cannot really remove those kind of things 100%, but we have to say something, I think. Thank you so much. I'm mindful of the time. Um, so I wanna thank the speakers for uh, sharing with us uh, their insights. It's been a great pleasure to uh, hear from you. And uh, I want to also thank the audience so for uh, um, participating and sending questions. I'm sorry we didn't get through all of them, um, but we might follow up some of them. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you also for joining from all over the world today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Have, have a good day. <laughs> yeah.